Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Art Gallery of Ontario. Uh, my name is Audrey Hudson. I'm the Richard and Elizabeth Curry Chief of Education and Programming uh, here at the AGO. Uh, I'd like to start us off with a land acknowledgement. Uh, so the land that uh, the AGO is on is Michisagi Anishinaabe Territory. It's also been occupied by the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, and the Wendat Confederacies. Um, you know, as we are here, we're creating, living, um, enjoying the land. Always think about uh, where we are and what place and the indigenous communities that are here, have been here, um, and are definitely here in the present. So, thank you. Let me say happy Black History Month. Right? Yeah, it's February. It's the month. <laughs> So let's, uh, yeah, let's celebrate that. Uh, we have a stacked programming uh, calendar of Black History Month events here at the AGO. Um, last night we started off with Rise Edutainment. They're here with us. Uh, yeah, definitely give it up for Rise. Um, they, and they are here with us for uh, three, two other Fridays uh, in February. Next, next weekend we have Molly Johnson coming out on a Friday. Yep, jazz great, Let, Molly Johnson. Uh, we also have Elaine Campbell, who is doing family programming, an author, performer. And then we're closing out the month with uh, Black-owned Toronto. Mar it's a marketplace, uh, which will be, we'll have 24 vendors uh, on this level selling their wares in all Black-owned uh, uh, businesses locally um, and uh, Canadian-wide. So that's our programming. And that's, that's just for February, right? But it's all the time, right? We want to we wanna make sure that we're doing this all the time. And then speaking to, you know, speaking to Julie and then other black leaders at the AGO, it's like, why was this important to do, to actually mark the month here at the gallery? We've never marked it in this, maybe this formal of a way, but actually having programming for a wide range of audiences was really something that was special to, to me and to, to, I will say to us, <laughs> um, to do at the gallery. So uh, we're, today we have a stellar, we have a really stellar talk acquisitions from new artists uh, uh, with Julia uh, heading this uh, uh, new department of arts of global Africa and the diaspora. So we'll be hearing from nine artists uh, and seeing the work that is now in the AGO's collection. I'm going to say thanks to Julie <laughs> and of course thanks to the uh, the collections committee, um, arts of uh, the Friends of Global Africa and the diaspora. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, I just, uh, one other thank you. Thank you, uh, of course, to Julie and Emily and Kathleen and uh, Annie for organizing and putting together this talk. And of course, thank you to all the artists. Julie will be say, uh, you know, saying more and being in conversation with the artists, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you to the media team and everyone that has helped put on this event. All right, so I think we're just gonna dive right in. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you all for being here today. Um, I know Paul is joining us from New York, so we're really excited to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Um, so the work that is in the collection is called Midnight Blue, and this work was featured and still is featured in Fragments of Epic Memory, um, which is actually touring right now. It's in Minneapolis as we speak. Um, so I think... Um, kind of get us started. Um, this piece, I mean, it's hard to tell in images, but um, you are using a very unique um, technique of picotage, um, as well as other materials. I was wondering if you could kind of speak a bit more about this work um, and what that process looks like when creating. Good evening. Happy Black History Month. <laughs> um, so just a little bit, bit of background on what I've done. I studied ceramics in school, and in 2012, while attending a ceramic residency, I began using my ceramic tools on photographs. And I was scanning images into the computer, printing them on photo paper, and then using my ceramic tools to scratch and pick at the surface of these photos. And eventually, I got kind of obsessed with the process mm. of making. And so after a number of years of doing that, you know, like I, you know, gave the, the, the practice a name of picotage, mm -hmm. which is I'm picking in uh, these small bits of picking into the paper in, these, in this small repetitive pa pattern. And in some ways it began to, you know, turn into the stylized 
form of this like reptilian skin. Mm -hmm. And I realized it's connected to uh, sort of a scarification and body modification, coming of age. And I was thinking about myself immigrating to, to the United States and how in some ways the process of me working on these images is kind of like me recording a memory mm -hmm. or thinking of uh, coming of age at a certain, of time, certain time. And so fast forward, what, 10 years after I've been making these works, uh, I traveled to London for the Notting Hill Carnival and then to Trinidad the following year um, and had these images that I took. And so I sort of like combined them in Photoshop and then printed them out uh, to make this work and then picked at the surface. And I should also mention that the photo is mounted to museum board and then I believe Daibon or Sintra to give me that f rigidity so I could mm -hmm. pick into the surface and Without create sort of, damaging. Yeah, and create this sort of like sculptural texture. And usually if someone's in the studio, I, I allow that visitor to touch the work to get a sense of what, it's, what it actually is mm -hmm. like. It's more like Velcro. Oh, yeah, and I mean, obviously when it's here, we can't touch it. So. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, and then, uh, I introduced painting to the surface of the photographs, which really sort of like created a sort of mythical creature. And I was thinking about the Paramin Blue Devils, but also um, this period of nighttime where this, you know, the color is kind of like a midnight blue. And so I'm taking a lot of history from how I grew up in Jamaica and putting that into this image. Amazing, thank you so much. Does that answer? Oh, oh, it does. It really does. Because okay. my follow-up question was going to be, how did you gravitate towards this technique? And you started off with that. So oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> yep. Our next artiste, Jorian. <laughs> um, just a little bit of a background and why I'm also excited to kind of share the stage in this context with Jorian. Um, so uh, Jorian's work is a very much a more recent acquisition um, during the time that I've um, been in this role. And um, I've had a pleasure of curating uh, Jorian Charlton Out of Many, which was on view um, here at the AGO last year. Um, so it's really exciting to kind of see this um, natural progression. Um, this work, uh, Georgia and Kukula, was... Um, yeah, recently acquired and also was shown at your show at Cooper Cole. Yeah. Um, and that was also last year. Mm -hmm. Last year, yeah. year of Jorian is what I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in general, your practice straddles fine art and fashion editorial photography. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you work with digital and analog film um, film photography. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this was shot on film, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, and in general, um, you're working with, you know, models um, as well as family members, you know, just kind of working through this collaboration between yourself and your sitters. Um, and this image, for instance, for instance, are, is of two sisters. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what um, what goes into kind of the making of these images when you are collaborating with, um, you know, families um, as opposed to models. Um, well, for this image in you know particular, I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't have like a fully developed concept. Um, I feel like for my images, like the subject is the most important like aspect mm -hmm. of my work, um, like the relationship I have with that person. Um, I guess before doing this image, I had been photographing like a few of my friends' um, kids and then thinking about my own kids and their relationship and just wanting to document that. Um, so yeah, even before the shoot specifically, I didn't even really have an idea of like where we would take these pictures or like 
what the, again, like the concept is really gonna be. Um, I was more trying to focus on like, you know, just composition mm -hmm. and like, um, and making it a little bit more like stylized. So I usually will like create a mood board and <clears throat> again, um, I feel like with all of my shoots really it's like more a collaborative um, process. Uh, so yeah, uh, repeat, repeat that again. Well, I, I think, I mean, I have a different question now, but <laughs> I know that you've also um, photographed Georgia on her own. Did, yeah. did this come before or after? Um, this was the same shoot. All the same, okay. Yeah, this is all the same series. Um, yeah, this is a part of the same series, but um, sorry, I'm going to say that. <laughs> That's okay. In terms of, um, especially when you're using film, um, yeah. I know there's more control that can happen inside a studio, for instance, but yeah. these were taken outside, um, like in Mississauga, right? Just yeah. like in a park. Um, Etobicoke, if you want to get Etobicoke, specific. so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I but how do you, yeah, how do you kind of navigate um, those discrepancies when you're outdoors? I prefer to be outdoors, really. Um, I don't know, to me, I feel like the studio can be a bit limiting. Like, mm -hmm. I like to use my environment. Um, and even if I am in studio, I'll try and, like, utilize, like, the whole studio mm -hmm. um, to give more of that, you know, environmental... Um, look if i am like indoors i do like more like domestic spaces um you know the bedroom living room um uh for this specifically with shooting film i feel like definitely film renders light differently than digital and i do prefer to be outside maybe when shooting with film um, but yeah, for this specifically, like I was saying before, I didn't really, I definitely knew I wanted to be outside for this, but um, even, we didn't even really pick this location until probably like 15 minutes before <laughs> shooting. Um, yeah. Amazing, thank you. Um, Jorian's work is also um, touring with the new Black Vanguard exhibition in Europe. Um, so big ups to Jorian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next artist is Emmanuel. Um, so I should say Paul, Emmanuel, and Isabel. I hadn't formally met before today. So hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Um, so the two works um, in our collection um, I've been thinking. In, I've been thinking of my father's garden, and I've been thinking of my mother's garden. Um, they're actually on view on the fourth floor, um, and they're quite beautiful. Um, so, if anyone has time afterwards, I'd encourage you to go upstairs and check those out in person because there are some details that um, don't translate um, on, as a digital image. Um, so, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your practice, um, and I know you you. Your work kind of explores the tensions between place and displacement. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could speak also a bit of the significance of gardens in your work too, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, for sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've been making paintings of garden spaces for a, a bit of time now. Um, and yeah, a lot of what I've been thinking about is this idea of like potential um, and an idea, this idea around like potential places of sanctuary or rest and the garden being kind of a, an interesting metaphor for that or a, a place that could hold that possibility. Um, these paintings, the ones, yeah, the ones here are, were sort of like a shift in my practice. Um, I made them when I was in grad school at the University of Guelph. Um, and yeah, at the time I, I was trying to make these paintings of gardens on materials that you could find in a garden. So I was making paintings on concrete and tarpaulins and canvas drop cloths and somehow trying to like embed the like 
yeah, to have a, a painting of a garden that wasn't just a representation of a garden, but felt like it came from, from the garden. Um, and before these works, I was making paintings that were like direct representations, like I would take a photograph of someone else's garden, and I would come back to the studio, and I would try to just recreate that photograph. Um, but after a while, it, it, I kind of got a bit angsty in the studio, and the work felt um, a bit too distant. So I was like, okay, like, um, what, what gardens are, are close to me or familiar to me, and maybe I could work off of that. And then I started realizing that I, I didn't really have a lot of experience in gardens, except for um, the, split, the, the place in my home in, in Nigeria where my dad always said he was gonna plant a garden, but it was this like clay, dusty area that I, I played soccer in all the time. And so I never actually wanted him to make a garden because then where would I play soccer? Um, but it was always something he would always talk about like, oh, when I have time or when I have enough money and we'll dig up the ground and put some compost and it'll be great. Um, but it just never happened um, because there's never enough time. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think I was in my studio and I was just like, oh, like what, what might they have made if they had the time, mm -hmm. if they had the resources and, you know, weren't just sort of like working so hard so that I can be, you know, I could be sent to university in North America and be here right now. <laughs> um, and I kind of opened up this thing where instead of just trying to paint other people's gardens, I started using the photographs of other people's gardens as a way to create these sort of fictional gardens. And so the work I make now kind of stems from that and there are these um, imaginary spaces that could potentially exist but are, are based on reality but don't actually exist. Yeah. Have your parents seen these kind of imagined spaces? Yeah, my, only my mom has, yeah. has seen the, my mom saw these two paintings and she liked the one that I named after my dad more mm. than the one I named after <laughs> her, which is kind of appropriate, <laughs> so yeah. Um, I think also um, something that's quite interesting, even with your work as well as Paul's, is that um, you do incorporate um, some element of mark making. Um, I'd love to come back to you, Paul, and kind of um, dive in a little bit more in terms of, because I know you as well as Emmanuel, you're working at various different scales. Um, and I've seen some of your work um, in New York that is quite large and still incorporating this kind of um, you know, the, the picotage technique. What, how does that um, process connect you more um, in terms of making the artwork? That's a great uh, question. I think whenever I take these images, and I use film, I use okay. 35 millimeter and transfer, transfer it over to digital, but whenever I make my images, I want myself first and foremost, and also the viewer to feel like they're experiencing what I'm seeing, as if you're outside, mm -hmm. um, seeing the outdoors. Because I looked at your images this morning, and I was like, yo, I like these. I kind of want one. <laughs> 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 because like I've always, I go to gardens and I take photos of gardens because they're like these calm spaces in the sense that, you know, like I also saw some other, sorry to go off topic, but these, I think ceramic sculptures that look like bird baths. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I want to see you make these even like you larger and like put yeah. them, you know, in the space because like you're attracting, you know, that uh, ecosystem of birds and bees and butterflies and these are the things that are interested in gardens it's like what are you observing and how does how do these creatures create uh, this saturated environment and pollinate other plants yeah. and create abundance and I think that's what uh, these works are about it's you know it's re regenerative and creating this like new atmosphere yeah. Um, and so whenever I make these images, yeah, they get larger, and they get la they've been larger, and I reach a capacity because they could barely get through the door now. Uh. They're like 80 <laughs> inches by 120 inches, and so I'm like, okay, I need to slow down. Yeah. Um, but I want you to feel like you're in that space. I want you to uh, 
I want you to be absorbed into the work. I, I look at a lot of abstract paintings mm -hmm. like Clifford Still, Rothko's, like larger than life uh, paintings, and I try to make my photographic images in that sort of capacity. Amazing. I feel like, I mean, especially the image that I have in my mind, um, and just going off of what you're saying of, you know, wanting to feel like you're in, you're in the image, there's um, an image of a crowd. I think that one's also in fragments. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that one, you do feel completely immersed in it. Yeah, so that image is in a small corner of this photograph. Uh, and so I, I usually scan these images in mm -hmm. a high resolution. So like what you're saying is film, is, it's much softer mm -hmm. than the digital artifact that we're seeing. And so when I scan these images and blow them up to a mm -hmm. large resolution, I get this softer tone. And then when I go back in to uh, pick over the surface, there's these harder edges. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at the contrast of... Uh, harder and softer like textures yeah. and yeah I'm interested in the textures mm -hmm. amazing thank you You're welcome um, finally Isabel <laughs> um, well I'm also very excited um, uh, to be sharing the stage with you as well today um, Isabel's work um, was a very recent um, even more recent acquisition um, we um, along with some of our AFGAD members, we were um, at Art Toronto um, and uh, were particularly drawn to these two images. Um, so on the left, A Thousand Lifetimes, and on the right, Spirit Traveler. Um, so one of the things I've you know, been itching to ask you um, is, in general, you're kind of process when creating images. Um, and I do have a follow-up question, but I'll let you kind of dive into that first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I think my process as of late, um, the last two, three years, has just been understanding that the way I want to, well, the way I want to present a certain part of my practice um, involves like world building and just the idea of recontextualizing found spaces and making them my own. I think that with the work that I make, I try to focus on like reality, but also um, <coughs> like a bit of fantasy and just something that gets people thinking a little bit more. Um, specifically with these two images, I made both of them around the same period of time in 2021 when I was at home in Nigeria and um, I was just doing a lot of collaborative work with um, Lagos-based designers, um, but also like working on a show that I had in Toronto at Gallery 44. Um, and so, a lot of the concepts I was interested in at that time were um, surrounding like spirituality and just this idea of a speculative element, um, something that's there but you know not really there, and how I could like take advantage of that curiosity and present images that you know just felt kind of like surreal in a way, even though it's it's just a portrait. Mm -hmm. So working with like designers like uh, Adeju Thompson of Lego Space Program, <laughs> who um, made the mask on the left and Bloke who made the mask on the right. Um, then tapping into that idea of masks and how historically um, in like Africa and Nigeria and everything, like the significance of masks and um, how they present like some sort of like authority and command um, power in a way. Um, one of the things that I remember reading about um, your work and is that you've coined a term um, called 
normatopia. Um, and I would love to hear more a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> the, I think the idea to coin a term in the first place was um, just feeling like what I wanted to do was neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also wanting something that, you know, a way to hold myself accountable. Because I think like when you put something out into the world like that, mm -hmm. you're responsible for the idea and responsible for making sure that, you know, you follow through with the things that you say you will. So for the longest time when I was ideating eternity, which is what I call like my visual universe. I was thinking about it as like a utopia and you know, it was a time, I don't wanna say it was a trend, but maybe it was kind of a trend. Um, <laughs> the whole idea of like a black utopia and just like, you know, um, I'm, I don't wanna say it's a trend because it's necessary. Like I feel like we deserve to have visualizations of that optimism and everything. But also like in 2020, it just felt so far from, you know, a utopia. And I was like, okay, I don't really want to strive for this perfection because it doesn't feel real to me in this moment. Like, I feel like just by, as a result of being like human beings and being normal, like mm -hmm. we're bound to make mistakes, we're bound to like have conflict, we're bound to have disorder in some way. Um, not necessarily like dangerous disorder, but just, you know, disorder. And attaching my work to that idea of a utopia meant that I couldn't stay true to humanity and human nature. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to <coughs> position my work in this space and this space is just normal. It's like, it's not perfect, but you know, it's it's a progression from you know harsh realities and like it's still something to strive towards, but it's more achievable to me. It's just normal. It's like elevating the parts of our realities that we already engage in, mm -hmm. and just like putting that on the forefront and highlighting that. And so, I was like, yeah, I'm going to create this term to describe that space that's like just normal and not perfect. Thank you. Um, I would love to thank all of you for um, being so generous um, with your words and giving us a little bit more insight on um, your practices. And as I mentioned, there are, a few, and you'll kind of see throughout, is that there are a few works that are um, on display. I rec I recommend fourth floor Emmanuel's work. Um, but yeah, if I, I believe a round of applause is in order for our wonderful <laughs> contributors. Um, and we are gonna take a little bit of a break before we switch over to our second group um, and Julie will be guiding um, that conversation. Thank you. Okay, we're back uh, for the second half of our program. Uh, and we're going to start with, uh, first of all, I, I don't know if I was remiss in uh, thanking everyone for coming out uh, t this afternoon, so thank you. I know it was uh, kind of cold and uh, snowy out there, so I really, uh, we all appreciate um, you taking the time to join us. Uh, so, Bidemi Olo Yedi. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so let's start with this work, um, which uh, we acquired in uh, 2021. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Bidemi is a former student of mine. I met him at OCAD, actually. Um, and we had some very great uh, conversations because um, Bidemi is really interesting in terms of uh, the development of his practice because so interested in the materiality, but also the process of making uh, photographs. And you're going, you went really old school by actually uh, creating um, tintypes, which was really uh, fascinating to me. So um, can you tell us about this work, Untitled uh, 
2018. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so this work, I actually made this photograph during the Pride March of in 2018, mm -hmm. uh, which was the one that had the big, like, heavy downpour of rain. It was also the first time I'd ever been to any Pride, because uh, for me, the camera is more like my, it's more like my passport that allows me to go uh, to places, because left to me, I'll probably just stay home. <laughs> <laughs> So that was my excuse to go to places. So this was the mm -hmm. first time I went to um, any Pride match. And as always, um, with me when I was first starting out during that time, um, any space I found myself in, I was always immediately looking for whoever else was like me mm -hmm. while I was there, because then it's like, it's very easy to feel alienated. I was usually by myself, and there was like, you know, I usually didn't go with friends. Um, so that was kind of how this came about. So this was right after um, the rain had passed, you could tell by the umbrella in her backpack. Mm -hmm. And there was like a concert just happening, this was at Young and Dunder, so there was a concert starting just right up at the stages. And, you know, the crowd was sort of slowly funneling through there, and then that was when I caught her, her silhouette. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because obviously, like, the buns mm -hmm. were like the first thing, and I was like, heavy downpour, she did a good job protecting the hair from the rain. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I was there, I was drenched, so. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just kind of like try to make my way through the crowd, not necessarily to get to the front of her or to talk to her or anything or to ask for like a portrait because then I didn't really, I wasn't brave enough to take photos of people. So I was just kind of observing. Um, so I just kind of like tried to get as close as I can. You can imagine just pride. So there was, and I was having a chunkier camera than this. It was kind of heavy, like a Hasselblad. Um, so this was as close as I was able to get. And there's always like a few seconds of observation where you're trying not to get too lost in the details because for me, I have to just create in the moment and then I do the thinking and the studying later. Um, but I was mostly drawn to um, the hair. Um, and then when you put it in the context of the event that we were at, which was like pride, you know, that's where we come to celebrate, you know, your identity and everything. Um, I felt like at that point, it was almost like, a, like an act of bravery to mm -hmm be able to be in the space. You could even tell from the crowd in this image, like she really sticks out. Mm -hmm. Like she was literally coming into the frame and taking up space. And mm -hmm. I felt like that was what I could relate to, like in terms of what I was trying to do with my camera. So that was why I gravitated immediately towards uh, that. And then obviously, um, as black people, we love to, you know, how would I put it, like uh, adorn ourselves mm -hmm. with these. Like I love the intricate, like little pearl earrings and, the bun was so clean, <laughs> you know, everything was so <laughs> intricately done, and I was just like, you know, there's that appreciation for it. Well, um, we can't really tell in this image, but when you see the actual object, the texture of her hair, the even uh, there is a, a a mirror. I think you we can see you. Yeah, you can see my reflection in the earrings, in the right? earrings which is just yeah, yeah. It's very very detailed. Yeah. Um, and just quickly, um, you really marry uh, documentary and portrait, uh, street photography um, uh, as part of your practice. But the other day we were speaking and you were like, I don't, I don't really fit into, or I'm a meld, uh, or I'm a um, conglomeration of, or a mixture of all of those um, ways of working in yeah. photography. Yeah. I mean, like you... You get told a lot, so you know, work in series and everything mm -hmm. has to be consistent and blah, blah, blah. Well, I, I like to kind of jump around the place, so mm -hmm. it's whatever, and it's not intentional, it's just kind of like whatever I'm interested in, I would, um, I'll just go after it. Mm -hmm. So if I meet someone on the street and their features are very, you know, like, I would be like, I want to take a portrait of you, you know, and that would be like a whole other thing. And most times I, you know, you're on the commute to work or whatever, and you see, I have like an appreciation for the mundane, like everyday life, mm -hmm. everyday people, not necessarily, you know, anything pop culture, very like popular. Um, so that's how I make my street images, you know? Mm -hmm. And then people are like, oh, where, like, where, where did that happen? Or whatever, it's like, you were with me and you didn't see it, you know? It's mm -hmm. just like, so there's, I have an appreciation for, for the things that we usually tend to walk by, you know, every day and stuff. So based on what we were talking about, um, yeah, it's just something that's gonna keep um, happening because my interests, flies um, 
just based on whatever I'm interested in. So with history and tin types and how that was used to, you know, like during the time of slavery to diminish blacks and trying to use that to reclaim that power and tell like a counter narrative to what we're constantly being um, taught, you know, like we saw it at Gradix, right, where um, there was a photo of Jack Gray where he was wearing um, an Adidas tracksuit where it looked like one of the images of slaves that we're so used to seeing. So people would look at it like, oh, like, where did he find this image? And it's like, is that Adidas? You know, and then that was like, so that starts to break the association, which was mm -hmm. part of what the work was talking about. You know, so it's kind of like an old, and, like an old process mixed with more contemporary That's subjects. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Sure. Sandra? Hello. Hello. <laughs> you might have to share the oh, mic. Yes. Yep. Um, so I'm, um, as always, thrilled to speak with you, Sandra. Um, we haven't had the opportunity, I don't know, for three years. Um, but uh, this is a really a special because uh, you were commissioned uh, to do this work for Fragments of Epic Memory. And we, you know, kind of went back and forth about the concept. Um, but uh, I want to ask you about two things, obviously. And they may seem obvious, but I think they're really um, important to this work and your practice as a whole, which is the title, which is, of course, related to a particular story, which is biographical, um, and the process. And the process. Mm -hmm. Well, um... I've always been working in gel transfers. I've been working with it for a while. And I remember when I had started to kind of, I wanted to kind of focus in on what it is about the medium that interests me so much. And also at the time, I was trying to kind of signal in on maybe an overall reason as to why I do all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, the gel transfer process is one by which I take an image I act, uh, from a found photograph or I take an image myself, I print it off, and then I transfer it using a medium from the print onto a surface, whether it be a wall or a wood panel or paper. And within the process of making the work, um, uh, depending on how much control or lack of control I have over the process, there, is, there are these imperfections that happen on the surface of the resultant piece. And those imperfections kind of, they allude to you know, history and memory and a weathered feel that old photographs have from being passed around from hand to hand. And it has this archival, um, archival connection as well, and this storytelling, and something that I like to connect with my family mm -hmm. and their migration here to Canada and their insistence in telling us all of these stories about back home that end up becoming like our stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've always had this connection with this other place, Guyana, although I was born here. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I see these old photographs, um, they're not just a simple picture, but they're weighted with all of these stories and this history and this past and whether good or bad. And, and when I look at you know, this photograph of my mother, I see this young woman who, you know, the, the story behind this photograph, mm -hmm. <laughs> my mom, she had wanted to go to England um, and she had these two young daughters, me and my sister, and she had found this cheap flight to go to England. She asked my dad if he wanted to go, and he's like, no, nah, I don't want to go. So she left us with my dad and my grandmother, and then she flew on her own to England and stayed with a family friend, therefore an uncle. And um, whenever I see this photograph, whenever I looked at this photograph, I just thought about this freedom that she had in venturing off to another place after probably for the first time being on a plane and coming here to Toronto. And also the freedom of flight, which I see in the birds as well, in these pigeons. And also the control she had over you know, her image in this photograph. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And when I think about the, um, like when you asked me to be in the exhibition, mm -hmm. Fragments, we were talking about different imagery to use for, um, for the exhibition, but I kept on being drawn back to this photograph. And I think there's, a, there's another reason for it. Like in the Fragments exhibition, in the, the uh, focus on these archives, there are different circumstances under which people are taken images of, right? So when I think about this photograph and the freedom that I see embedded in my mom's action and as well in, in her representation within that action, like she is in control here, it just, I just felt it was, you know, an interesting kind of juxtaposition. Yeah. yeah. Um, very quickly, um, I wanted to ask you about scale mm -hmm. um, in relation to this question Paul was uh, answered as well as Emmanuel. Um, there's another uh, work of yours on the second floor and it's, you know, large scale and of course uh, this work. Um, how, what are your feelings about? Is it important to uh, create work that is, you know, life size, larger than life, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of all of the ideas that you want to kind of uh, embed in in yeah. the work? I think for for me, scale is scale is connected to this idea. Somebody was talking about this idea of taking up space, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> you know, I've been doing a lot of work here for a while. Mm -hmm. And there are times when, you know, a lot of artists are not invited into these spaces. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm working in these ways and taking over wall space and making these panels huge, it is to monumentalize the stories and the people within the frame, as well as to take up space within these spaces mm -hmm that are, that were, and at some time, still not as welcoming mm -hmm. as they should be, considering the, the presence of many different communities here and the contributions they've given to this country. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to kind of, yeah, to embed that into the whole idea as well. It makes sense to me, and I think Paul was talking about this too, this idea of allowing the viewer to embed themselves into the piece that you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think with artists, there's something, and I see that with Denise Tomasis as well, mm -hmm. is when people, when you are creating something and you're so in it, you want, it's what Paul was talking about, you mm -hmm. want the public you want other people to experience what you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because you have the ability to create these things with your hands tangibly, you are pushing, if you are able to do so, you're pushing in that direction. You want mm -hmm. people to experience what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, speaking about an artist who has had a long, long, long career. Um, <laughs> yes, please. Let's. Jan Wade, uh, thank you for coming all the way from Vancouver, uh, but Hamilton born. Um, I'm, this is a very new uh, acquisition, so uh, we are thrilled to have it in the collection at the AGO. It's not up uh, for view yet, but it will be. Um, and I have always been drawn to your work. You're, you know, multidisciplinary um, um, artist, um, textile, sculpture, uh, paintings, um, but the memory jug, you know, it, it's they're so visceral. Um, can you just let us in <laughs> to, you know, how did you start working in this way with these, uh, these vessels, which are like, they're assemblage, you know, you're building on top of them. I'll stop talking because I just want to hear you. <laughs> That's okay. Yes. Well, I just turned 70 in November. <gasps> <laughs> so I have been around for a while. 
historically and otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I am turning into a fossil. <laughs> um, I guess I would have to really start with, yes, I was born in Hamilton, Ontario in 1952. My parents met in high school and um, became engaged in 1951, had me in 1952. When they were engaged, they were hauled in by the Hamilton Police Department morality squad be, to be questioned because miscegenation, the mixing of the races, was still on the law books, still ostensibly. And you know now, of course, you see people of mixed race together all the time, but in those days, you did see people of mixed race together, but they weren't legally trying to get married. Mm. So that was the crunch. So when my mother and father met, they got married. My mother's family basically disowned her until, and so she went to live with my father, with my great grandmother and my grandmother in their house. And my parents were both very young. My mom had me when she was 18. My father turned 20 the day before I was born. So they both worked and I was at home all day with two elderly black ladies from the Southern United States. <laughs> and, you know, it was a very domestic space. It was a very intellectual space. Just the feeling of the surrounding. We lived in an old house. We, like many other black families, didn't have a lot in terms of material possessions. So we reused and used every scrap of material, every bit of whatever that we had. My grandmother had an old button box, which I was fascinated by. It may as well have been the Metropolitan Museum of Art <laughs> because you saw everything in there, the Art Deco period, the Art Nouveau period, old shell buttons, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And where did this come from? Grandma, where did this come from? You know, she'd go, oh my God, will this child stop talking? But <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, I was basically raised in a pretty much black community until I was four, and my parents eventually moved. But my great-grandmother and my grandmother were my world, and my cousins, et cetera, because they lived on the next street. Um, and I suppose, yeah, my whole aesthetic sense of life really came from a real black Southern tradition. Mm -hmm. So when I'm making a piece like the memory jog, I think when I was about 12 or 13, I was at a dentist's office and I, and I picked up a National Geographic magazine or something and they just happened to have two photographs, one of um, sculptural in an old black Southern graveyard that was very modernist. There were just like these incredible shapes and circles. I'm sure that have probably disintegrated into the ground or were destroyed or whatever since then. And then they had one photograph of what they call the memory jug. And basically, as I started looking up the meaning of memory jugs, well, when um, in black slave cultures, somebody died and was buried. A lot of times they just take their possessions and lay them on the grave, like their clothing, their favorite cup, their favorite spoon, whatever possession they had. And then it would just disintegrate into the ground. And then I guess somebody got the idea where they would use a vessel. And I love vessels because a vessel is like a body part almost, mm. depending on what size the vessel is. I think this vessel in this piece was, um, from Chinatown, and it was, I like to use vessels that were used in some kind of real working situation, either domestically or, you know, used to store things, or I, I find the vessel really much like a, almost like a torso, a body part. Sometimes they have, they're very large and they have a lot of gravatas, but now I use very tiny vessels too, I use any vessels. Um, so also the, this vessel is covered in buttons because well, as I say, I had a, growing up had a fascination with buttons. I think buttons were one of the oldest utilitarian objects um, created in the industrial revolution, yada yada, but of course they have a much older history than that. So when I use these buttons and I cover a surface, I remember when I was small, I learned how to count with buttons and it's almost like I'm counting the number of Africans brought from Africa to the New World, so-called New World, but we know it was an old world, um, <laughs> through the African diaspora. I'm just learning more about my family history, and it turns out that I thought it was basically the southern United States. But of course, you know, as you go back, it turns out that our family came from Cuba to the southern United States somehow through the slave trade, and our oldest and our most our black DNA from Africa is mostly from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
which is a state that I have. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> Which is a state I've always been fascinated with because I think they're so incredibly creative um, and have such a horrible history. But through that all, you know, when I was, um, I did my first Biennale, was the first international art Biennale in Johannesburg, and it was like seven months after Nelson Mandela had been elected. And I just started, I just found out about the American, African American artist Betty Saar, mm. and I heard that she was going to. Be at the BNL, so I was so excited. I rushed up to her space and I sat there and was just sitting in her space for about an hour. And then I went to get in the elevator because I was going to meet my curator for lunch. And this little woman came running in, hold the elevator, she says, and she comes running into the elevator. She has a mauve afro. And I said, Excuse me, but are you with the Americans? She goes, I go, are, Do you know Betty Saar? Is she here? And she goes, I am Betty Saar. <laughs> <laughs> and so Betty has always said something that made so much sense to me in terms of being a black female artist. Mm -hmm. Like, don't listen to the bullshit, remain calm, and do your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is my motto, basically. <laughs> um, so when I look at the surface of this vessel, which is sort of like a more of a societal memory jug, I'm not gonna place it on somebody's grave and let it disintegrate mm -hmm. back into the earth, but. Um, I think of counting the Africans in the diaspora that came to this world. Mm -hmm. um, all the symbols I love to use are iconic. Mm -hmm. These tourist sculptures, which this one I think is probably from Kenya, um, I use now in a lot of pieces. I've actually started doing an offshoot of the memory jugs. They still use vessels, but they're, well, they're a little different. Um, <laughs> And I do use a lot of these figures because they come from an early tourist industry where I suppose somebody went to Africa, saw these incredible carvers, said, hey, we could make some money. You could sell these things in the airport. And so, you know, some master carvers probably said, okay, I can make some money for my family. And they started making these pieces that were basically for a tourist industry. So I love using pieces that are kind of connected to work and sort of like an early consumer culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes people have said, well, you know, you're using this woman and she's from Kenya. How do you relate that to the slave trade? Well, now we know through DNA, D -D 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 -D, that Africans from all over Africa were shipped to the, to the North America through the slave trade because there was slavery in Africa. There is slavery still in Africa. Um, there is... Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it is so amazing how we come so far and, and all of these pieces that get made that kind of, you know, I find these, place, these pieces in thrift stores, in, online, et cetera, et cetera. So there she is, and she's surrounded by a deer antler, which is how quintessentially Canadian, Canadian can you get. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and... I remember going to do an artist residency in North Carolina, and I went down to Chinatown in New York, and I got on the Dragon Bus, which is basically, essentially, if you don't know anything about it, it's the poor people's way of traveling in America. Mm -hmm. You pay $60 return, you get on this bus, they drive like a bat out of hell. You're going to, you want to be dropped off in Greensboro, North Carolina. Everybody brings their own food, you know, yada, yada. I just remember it was a stormy, rainy night, and we're driving into, we're crossing the border into Virginia, which is where my great-grandmother and grandmother came from, Danville, Virginia. And I remember saying to my grandmother one time, gee, Grandma, I would really, you know, Mana, I would really love to go down south and see where you come from. And she looked at me <laughs> very seriously, and she hardly ever looked at me seriously. She always had laughter in her eyes and a, a real passion for life in her eyes, and she just looked at me seriously and said, I don't ever want you to go to the South. Mm -hmm. And so there I was on my way to the South <laughs> <laughs> on this bus, this dragon bus, and just a flash of lightning comes up. It's very filmic, and it says, welcome to Virginia. And I just remember the phrase coming into my head, their blood is in, in the soil. soil. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of, you know, when we think of, oh, we've got all these movements where they're trying to eradicate black history and yada, yada, but, I mean, black history is the history mm -hmm. of North and South America. There would be no America without Af the African slave trade. 
I mean, America would not be America without the African slave trade, that free labor that basically built everything. Um, so wow. this is basically one of the things this piece is about. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll have a little bit of time for questions. I'm sure a lot of people have uh, some questions for all of you. Preston, welcome. Um, so, a uh, fairly new um, acquisition from 2020, last from last year, um, and uh, really, really interested in the way you're working with uh, textile, um, quilting, embroidery. Um, so, I, I guess I wanted to ask why you were so drawn to thinking about painting in um, in another way, which I think that's what you're always trying to develop through your, your practice, especially with this work. Yeah, so uh, this painting for me really was sort of the first major work in which I was thinking about sort of combining textiles with painting. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my uh, sort of impulse into doing this was to think about painting as um, to think about it more in the sense of canvas being a fabric as opposed to this sort of rigid surface, uh, this impenetrable surface. So in creating this work, I really wanted to uh, sort of play with ideas that um, some of these other great artists have talked about in terms of scale. Um, and this work is fairly big. It's about six foot across. Uh, and it features acrylic paint um, sort of soaked into the canvas through like a staining technique and um, embroidered text as well as an embroidered flower. So for me, this work is really about uh, sort of a gesture of like an encounter. Mm -hmm. um, so I embroidered this text for a poem that I wrote into the canvas. Uh, as well as this flower. And for me, it was just sort of setting up this idea of the viewer encountering this figure who um, is larger than life, mm -hmm. but is also sort of imagined. Um, it's not based off of a real person. Uh, so in a way, sort of encountering this figure would be a way of encountering me as the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the text of the poem reads, down an unlit corridor, uh, around the corner and in the shadows, apart from yourself, I know it's you. To take one finger and stick it through a hole in the lace, I know it's you. The stained black glass of your skin so true, lying bare, naked, in all the doom and gloom, here when I find your skin behind the lattice. Um, and then sort of under the arch of his legs, there's a bit of text that says one layer left. And to the far left, there's some more text that says, a wash on a raft, no side of the shore, a hand for support, another for sure. Um, so in sort of setting up this juxtaposition of the small embroidered text with the sort of large format painting, I wanted to draw the viewer closer and sort of encounter this poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you really, we don't have the work yet because it's been traveling. I can't wait to, to see it in, in person. Um, you also talk about um, the fact that these are not self-portraits, but averted self-figurations. Can you just quickly define what that means for you? Yeah, that term, I don't know if it's entirely accurate these <laughs> days. <laughs> so you've shifted, um, okay. Yeah, uh, in the past I'd sort of thought about these uh, images as self-portraits. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think of them as that these days as much. Um, mainly, I sort of, sort of uh, see them as um, a way for the viewer to encounter me, sort of behind the curtain, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, like in this work, for like specific example. Um, the figure's gaze is locked on the viewer. And uh, it's sort of a strange composition in that the figure has three arms. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the arm in the back, in my sort of view, it's sort of showing something uh, transpiring in motion. So 
this hand, which isn't fully revealed in the painting, is grabbing up and offering a flower to mm -hmm. the viewer, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense to entice them to come closer. Um, and this sort of idea of encounter is uh, something that figures into a lot of my work mm -hmm. these days, too. Um, and I think it's a queer gesture, uh, this idea of encounter. But in this painting in specific, with this uh, sort of faded skull in the background, I'm sort of hinting that this encounter might not be entirely what it seems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the kind of enigma enigmatic sensibility of, of the work uh, as well. Thank you. Oh, we have a, actually, uh, as you were speaking, I could have gone to the slide. Um, so we have a close up um, of the poem. Uh, and again, you really do have to be standing the encounter um, very close to the work in order to, to read the poem. And last not, but not ever least, Marija Katenge Banza. Um, so, uh, so interesting, this was the first uh, work that we acquired uh, in the department uh, in 2020. Um, I think I first saw the work at uh, Art Toronto, but of course you know, we knew uh, each other. Um, so I want you to talk about the painting, uh, the series, Christ Pentacreter number 13, um, and then in relation to uh, the installation that we did in the uh, From Gallery. Oh, thank you. And I'm so, and I'm very uh, happy to be the first black in the black collection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> and um, just for to saying, I'm not just painting uh, icon. Mm -hmm. So, because in my uh, my work is, uh, I take the project, is it like a project? Actually, I want to painting icon and maybe in two years I will just change it. So I already have, um, first I'm a painter and um, one day I decided to go to study in French. In France, not French, sorry for my English. Sometime I will ask many people in the room to translate for me. <laughs> And um, that gave me the, the way to try photo, to try installation, to try, so that's why my work is like a multidisciplinary work. But to talk about Christ Ponte Quattro, it's, um, it's a long time I was thinking to, um, to speak about the, the, my relation with Catholic religion, because I'm Catholic, I'm going to church, I'm still singing in the choir, it's, uh, I think so, until the end of my life, I will be stay Catholics. It's, uh, and that, it was the fight inside of me to understand. Um, because in my family, we grow up in the way to, um, I think so my father and my mother, I don't know if they are thinking about that, but they teach us uh, to learn how, how uh, to learn to understand the environment, to understand the system. Not, not white system, just to understand the system. That brings me when I go to live in Nantes to starting to understand the system I was living. And to understand that system bring me back in the Congo because I'm from DRC, that's why I was saying, oh, from DRC. And um, every time in my work, I try that, want to understand the system. And for me, the Catholic system, many people thinking is the Catholicism is disappeared, the Catholicism, but for me, it does not disappear. It's not because I'm Catholic, it's because the way I understand that system, the way that system goes and travel around the world, um, the link they have between the ad, uh, colonization ad, administration, they help each other. So, for the icon, for me, it was the first time I've, that's when I travel, my parents give me the Bible, everybody in my family signed in the side, in the Bible, and they, give it, they also give me the little icon. It's like you can just put at home, as in the Catholics, you know, you pray every morning and every night. And also, I was a um, guard, security guard in the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Nantes, and in different place in, uh, in France. 
And I discover a little time every time the mask from different uh, area in Africa. It was just in my head. And but in 2017, I was working in the Fine Art Museum in Montreal. And I discovered one of the masks from the village of my mom. So that just give me to say, oh, now I find how I can talk about the Catholic religion, the relation I have with that. Because my grandfather is the chief of the village. And every time I was speaking, talking with people in the museum about the mask, for them they were telling me, oh, this is the, um, the true, the original mask because African people, Congolese people, they never meet white people, so they stay like true, very, very true uh, original people. And the, all the mask you create after the colonization is not the original because you already made white, so you lost something. And um, for me, this, this idea to take something that give me, the was saying is Catholics, the icon he was saying is Catholics, and I discover it's not Catholic, it's from the, the Ukraine, Russia, it's Orthodox icon, but we are using that like as a Catholic because we, we, we pray because it's a Jesus. And the difference between the Orthodox and the um, Catholics about the imagery, and um, Catholic religion, we show the Christ every time suffering on the cross, people crying. But for the Orthodox, the image I was giving for the Christ, sometimes on the, uh, in the icon is the, um, the Christ with the mother or the Christ, but Christ Pantocrator, that means um, the glorious Christ. And for me was how I can bring that um, African mask, we, Sorry, um, every museum in Europe we own to this museum. They don't store. We own them this uh, this mask, and uh, I was linked that with another installation I have called the National T and Moa, the National Museum of Africa. This installation I create. I bring people inside, but they don't see anything, and I tell them we own mask to. Rome to this museum, and that helped me to bring this all data I have from different masks I own people in in the world to put that on the face of the Christ, like they put religion on my face. And that idea was to say, and also in the art history. Uh, so I bring many things in the small piece because it's a, it's a really it was the first time I do the small painting. And uh, because it was very small, I was thinking to do a chapel. So that's why when, we, when you acquire the, uh, the, the, the icon, you call me and we talk about the, the project. Because many people was just thinking, I'm just doing the icon. So my, my idea is not just to doing the icon, is to make many chapels in the world with the icon. Because the idea of the chapel is the space we go to, the, to, to pray, but is also the space um, coming in another space and changing many things in the territory. Because uh, I discovered when I was doing my research, a uh, Jesuit priest was uh, asking um, army or police to go to burn the village and exchange the Jesuit was telling people, you need to go to work on the, um, that way uh, you need to speak in French. Rubber plantation. Yeah, rubber plantation, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> rubber plantation. So I discovered uh, different writing from the Jesuit and the Belgium organization, the way they was helping each other. And for me, like I was saying, they bring some, another space and this, this has changed many things. The force people to become Catholics, to go to work, because if, uh, like you were saying, if you are poor, you give your, um, your time for to work in the robbery, you will go in the heaven. So for me to bring that space in the Western is, um, is my reflection about how I'm fighting. I'm still fighting myself. Because if, like I'm thinking, if I'm not Catholic today, Yes, I know a little bit about my family story, but I, I don't know how, how my ancestor was praying. 
So I grew up as in the Catholics. Everything I learned, everything grew up, my education is still Catholics. The way I move, the way I'm thinking, sometimes the way I'm dreaming, it's still Catholics because it's, it's like in my bones. So I'm still fighting with that. So to doing this, um, this, this artwork for me, it's like a little bit liberation, a little bit reflection, a little bit to put just to say, that's me. That me today, that me tomorrow, uh, that's the way I change because someone coming and force me to become like this. Thank you, Marisha. Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank you all uh, for your generosity this afternoon, um, to giving a glimpse of your practice, allowing us to take care. We are now stewards of your work. Uh, so thank you, and, and thank you all for attending. Uh, continue to support the work that we do, I hope. And um, please walk around the AGO and see some of the work in person. Thank you.